Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all your many blessings and for the way you've led us in the past. Please continue to guide us, send your Holy Spirit to work on our hearts, work on our minds, give us the wisdom that we need and the strength to stand firm for you. In Jesus' name, amen. How many like history? Today, we're going to first have a little history lesson. We're going to take a journey in our minds back exactly 500 years ago this coming Tuesday to a place we know today as the country of Germany. In the 1500s, Germany was not a single country like it is today. It was a huge collection of numerous states and provinces and free cities. Each of these states, provinces, and free cities were ruled by dukes and princes, sort of similar to how this nation is made up of individual states and is ruled by governors and mayors. Each of these rulers held a say in what laws were passed and how those laws were enforced in their respective territories. In the early morning hours of October 31 in the year 1517, the elector Frederick of Saxony, known as Frederick the Wise, awoke at his palace in Schweinitz, about 35 miles from the town of Wittenberg. When he arrived downstairs in the presence of his brother, Duke John, who was then co-regent with him, the elector said, I must tell you a dream, brother, which I had last night, and of which I should like to know the meaning. It is so firmly graven in my memory that I should never forget it, even if I were to live a thousand years, for it came three times, and always with new circumstances. Having gone to bed last night tired and dispirited, I soon fell asleep after saying my prayers and slept calmly for about two and a half hours. I then awoke, and all kinds of thoughts occupied me till midnight. I reflected how I should keep the festival of all saints. I prayed for the wretched souls in purgatory, and begged that God would direct me, my counsels, and my people according to the truth. I then fell asleep again, and dreamed that the Almighty sent me a monk who was a true son of Paul the Apostle. He was accompanied by all the saints, in obedience to God's command to bear him testimony and to assure me that he did not come with any fraudulent design, but that all he should do was conformable to the will of God. They asked my gracious permission to let him write something on the doors of the palace chapel at Wittenberg, which I conceded through my chancellor. Upon this, the monk repaired thither and began to write. So large were the characters that I could read from Schweinitz what he was writing. The pen he used was so long that its extremity reached as far as Rome, where it pierced the ears of a lion which lay there, and shook the triple crown on the Pope's head. All the cardinals and princes ran up hastily and endeavored to support it. You and I both tendered our assistance. I stretched out my arm that moment. I awoke with my arm extended to great alarm and very angry with this monk, who could not guide his pen better. I recovered myself a little, it was only a dream. I was still half asleep and once more closed my eyes. The dream came again. The lion, still disturbed by the pen, began to roar with all his might, until the whole city of Rome and all the states of the Holy Empire ran up to know what was the matter. The Pope called upon us to oppose this monk and addressed himself particularly to me because the friar was living in my dominions. I again awoke, repeated the Lord's Prayer, entreated God to preserve His holiness, and fell asleep. I then dreamt that all the princes of the empire, and we along with them, hastened to Rome, and endeavored one after another to break this pen. But the greater our exertions, the stronger it became. It crackled as if it had been made of iron. We gave it up as hopeless. I then asked the monk, for I was now at Rome, now at Wittenberg, where he had gotten that pen, and how it came to be so strong. This pen, replied he, belonged to a Bohemian goose a hundred years old. I had it from one of my old schoolmasters. It is so strong because no one can take the pith out of it, and I myself quite astonished at it. On a sudden, I heard a loud cry. From the monk's long pen had issued a host of other pens. I awoke a third time. It was daylight. So just as Frederick was finishing telling Duke John this dream in Schweinwitz, 35 miles away, a lone Roman Catholic monk stepped up to the castle door at Wittenberg 
to nail a list of 95 theses to it. Seemingly a common act should not be noticed by most people. However, those hammering sounds began to echo through the surrounding countryside, and they began a ripple effect that has multiplied and strengthened through the centuries and is destined to escalate into a showdown that will stop time on planet Earth and dethrone the devil himself. Most of you are probably familiar with this act of Martin Luther, but perhaps you're not aware of some of the other events which preceded and followed it and helped to turn this act from a common act of a lone monk to the most earth-shattering movement known today. Remember that the monk in Frederick's dream had said that he got the pen from a bohemian goose that was 100 years old. Ironically, the name Huss means goose in Bohemian. A Bohemian by the name of John Huss had been burned at the stake 100 years before. As an executioner had tied Huss to the stake, Huss had told him, you are now going to burn a goose, but in a century you will have a swan that you can neither roast nor boil. If he were prophetic, he must have meant Martin Luther, who shone about 100 years after and who had a swan for his arms. As Luther nailed those 95 theses to the church door, he probably didn't have a clue what a tempest that he was about to stir up. He simply had a protest, and he wanted to make his voice heard. But just like in Frederick's dream, by the next year, Rome was in an uproar. They demanded that Luther be handed over to them to deal with, but Frederick, realizing the implications of his dream, refused to surrender Martin Luther to the Romanists. In July of the following year, 1519, the champion of the Catholics, Johann Eck, had a debate with Luther at Leipzig. The topic could be summarized with the title, Sola Scriptura. Eck claimed that the church and the pope were the ones to interpret the scripture, and Martin Luther claimed that the Bible was its own interpreter and that every believer had the God-given right to understand the Bible for themselves and that the Holy Spirit would interpret it. This debate would ultimately prove to be the cause of Rome condemning Martin Luther. Meanwhile, due in a great degree to the influence of Frederick, Charles I, who was king of Spain at that time, was elected to be Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and was crowned in Germany in the month of October. By June of the next year, 1520, Pope Leo X issued a bull excommunicating Martin Luther and condemned all his writings to the flames. Anyone found to be in sympathy with Luther and opposed to the execution of the Pope's bull was to be excommunicated. To show his opinion of the bull, Luther burned it. Charles V was entering a war with France and it would take place on the Italian soil. He could not risk offending the Pope. However, he also owned his imperial crown to the influence of Frederick, one of the most powerful and influential dukes of the German Empire. So he could not risk offending Frederick either. He decided that Martin Luther was a valuable card to have in this game that was about to be played. If the Pope chose to support Charles, then he would hand Luther over to the Pope to be destroyed. But if the Pope chose to support the King of France, then Charles would protect Luther and make him the opposing power to the Pope. Both the Pope and the Emperor thought that they had Martin Luther in the palm of their hands. They didn't realize that the higher power that Martin Luther wielded had both of them in the palm of his hands. All three European powers, the Emperor, the King of France, and the Pope, were enemies of the Reformation. Had they, at any time, united their force of arms, the strength would have been such as that by all human reckoning, they should easily have accomplished their mutual purpose of putting down the reformers' movement. But their personal ambitions would not allow this. Each aspired to be the first man of his time, and this kept them in perpetual rivalry, and their kingdoms in continual misery and war. The papal see sought to dictate to both Charles and Francis and both of those sovereigns, on the other hand, were unwilling to let go of the power that they held over the church. This striving for superiority among these three powers turned out to be a wall of defense, so to speak, for the Protestant movement. In 1521, Charles called for a diet to be held at the city of Worms. This was to settle the schism of which the reformers had made with the papal church. 
The emperor summoned Luther to appear before the diet and issued him a safe conduct, which was assurance from the emperor that Luther had the protection of the state. When Luther arrived at Worms under the escort of the imperial herald, the crowds that turned out to welcome Luther were more than what turned out to welcome the emperor himself. During the diet, the pope had agreed to join forces with Charles to fight the king of France. So Charles determined in return to surrender Luther to Rome. But when Luther gave his famous answer to the diet, here I stand, I can do no other, several powerful leaders of the German provinces chose to join with Luther in his reformation. While the debate was happening in the diet as to what to do with Martin Luther, Duke Frederick summoned his secretary and chaplain, George Spalatin, to his private chambers. Spalatin was good friends with Luther and was also Duke Frederick's personal confidant and traveled with the Duke in his private carriage. When they were alone, Frederick announced to Spalatin his desire to protect Luther from harm. The idea to secretly abduct Luther was formulated, but Frederick had to let others carry it out so that he would not know where Luther was. On April 26, Luther, surrounded by 20 gentlemen on horseback, left the city of Worms. After their departure, the emperor made an edict against Martin Luther, placing him outside the pale of the law and commanding all men everywhere, once his safe conduct had expired, to withhold from him food, water, shelter, and to do all within their power to apprehend him and turn him over to Rome. This edict of Worms was drafted by papal representatives and ratified by a meeting in the emperor's private chamber after Elector Frederick and those favorable to Luther had already left. The edict was dated May 8, but in reality, the imperial signature was not placed on it until May 26. The purpose of the antedating was to give it the appearance of carrying the authority of the full diet, when in reality, those members favorable to Luther were not even present or aware of this decision. In 1521, the Diet of Worms condemned Luther and the Reformation. There immediately followed the Edict of Worms, that is the key to the protest in which originated the word Protestant. This edict was issued by Emperor Charles V, the ablest and most powerful monarch of the 16th century. After denouncing Luther personally in sweeping terms, the imperial edict says, we have therefore sent this Luther from before our face, that all pious and sensible men may regard him as a fool and a man possessed of the devil. And we expect that after the expiry of his safe conduct, effectual means will be taken to arrest his furious rage. Wherefore, under pain of incurring the punishment due to the crime of treason, we forbid you to lodge the said Luther as soon as the fatal term shall be expired, to conceal him, give him meat or drink, and lend him, by word or deed, publicly or secretly, any kind of assistance. We enjoin you, moreover, to seize him or cause him to be seized wherever you find him and bring him to us without any delay, or to keep him in all safety until you hear from us how you are to act with regard to him until you receive the recompense due to your exertions in so holy a work. As to his adherents, you will seize them, suppress them, and confiscate their goods. As to his writings, if the best food becomes the terror of all mankind as soon as a drop of poison is mixed with it, how much more ought these books, which contain a deadly poison to the soul, to be not only rejected but also annihilated? You will therefore burn them, or in some other way destroy them entirely. As to the authors, poets, printers, painters, sellers, or buyers of placards, writings, or paintings against the Pope or the Church, you will lay hold of their persons and their goods and treat them according to your good pleasure. And if anyone, whatever be his dignity, shall dare to act in contradiction to the decree of our Imperial Majesty, we ordain that he shall be placed under the ban of the Empire." Let everyone conform hereto. And that the emperor meant every word of that edict and that it should be enforced in full of all that it said is made plain by the following sentence which he wrote with his own hand. Sprung from the Christian emperors of Germany, from the Catholic kings of Spain, the Archduke of Austria, and the Dukes of Burgundy, all who are illustrious as defenders of the Roman faith, it is my firm purpose to follow the example of my ancestors. A single monk, led astray by his own folly, set himself up in opposition to the faith of Christendom. 
I will sacrifice my dominions, my power, my friends, my treasure, my blood, my mind, and my life to stay this impiety. A few days later, Luther and a few remaining traveling companions separated from the rest of the group and continued toward their destination. As they were passing through the lonely part of the forest of Thuringia, they were suddenly surrounded by five masked horsemen who were armed from head to foot. They roughly pulled Luther from the wagon, threw a military cloak over his shoulders, and placed him on a horse. Then as quickly as they had appeared, all six riders disappeared into the thick forest. All day they rode this direction and that, assuring themselves that anyone attempting to follow them would be completely baffled. After darkness settled in, they began to ascend a mountain, and a little before midnight, approached a castle at its summit. The drawbridge was let down, the portcullis raised, and the mysterious troop entered. Luther was led to an apartment where he was told that he must stay for an indefinite length of time, that during his stay he must lay aside his ecclesiastical dress and dressed in the custom of a knight. He was told to be known only as Knight George. Luther's abduction was carried out so mysteriously that for a time even Frederick of Saxony was not aware that Luther was in Wartburg Castle. Luther's disappearance brought joy to the Romanists. They thought they were rid of him. Pope Leo helped Charles fight the French and conquered more land for the Papal Church, but he died as soon as he returned to Rome, and Pope Adrian VI took his place. But mysteriously, writings from the pen of Luther kept appearing and circulating throughout Europe. Luther used his time behind the walls of Wartburg not only to write and circulate publications, but to translate the Bible. He translated the Bible's New Testament into the German language. As Luther disappeared inside the walls of Wartburg Castle, Europe was facing a crisis. Solomon and the hordes of Turks were invading Hungary, Austria, and the southern portion of the German states, attempting to conquer Europe, and the rulers of Europe had their hands full trying to deal with all of that, so they didn't have much time to devote to dealing with Luther. Meanwhile, by 1522, some fanatical followers of Luther's new reforms began to preach against all human learning and to enlist the disgruntled peasants to help fight against the order and society of Germany and to overthrow the old order. These fanatics not only rejected the authority of Rome, they also claimed to receive inspiration from the Holy Spirit, and this led them to tend to reject the Bible testimony in favor of their impressions. This caused Luther to leave the safety of Wartburg Castle and go back into society to preach against these false prophets. They met with Luther to try to show him that they were guided by God's Spirit. The spirit, the spirit, cried they. Luther, adopting that cool tone of contempt and cutting and homely language so familiar to him, said, I slap your spirit on the snout. Through the blessing of God and his preaching, he was able to expose and stop this fanaticism that had taken place, and those false prophets were defeated, and they left, went somewhere else. The emperor, when he went back to Spain, he started the Inquisition there killed some 3,000 followers of Luther's teachings. But he had arranged for a diet to be held at Nuremberg. It was a diet of regency, and that was to be what ruled the affairs of state while he was gone to Spain. This diet sent a letter to Pope Adrian stating that they would not enforce the emperor's decree, the Edict of Worms, because to execute Luther would start a civil war in Germany. They also included with this letter to the Pope a list of 100 grievances that they had with the Papal Church. And they said that these needed to be addressed by the Pope. When the Pope got this list of grievances, he flew into a rage and he wrote a scathing denunciation back to Frederick of Saxony. When the Pope's response was read to Frederick, he placed his hand on his sword which was a symbol that he was prepared to go to war. And if it had not been for Martin Luther, who remained calm and told Frederick of Saxony that the gospel was not to be won by bloodshed, he would have declared war on the Pope. In 1523, Pope Adrian died and was replaced by Clement VII. The emperor called for an imperial edict to be held at Nuremberg in 1524. Pope Clement sent his representative, Campeggio, to the Diet 
to push for the execution of the Edict of Worms and the death of Martin Luther. The German leaders asked what had been done about their list of grievances, and the dishonest Compeggio pretended that the Pope and himself had not thought that the list was really from the German princes, and so they had ignored it. This news, of course, infuriated the German princes. The emperor, on the other hand, was so involved with the war in France that he could not attend the Diet himself, but he sent his ambassador to complain to the Diet that they had not enforced the Edict of Worms, and he demanded that it be put into execution, and he wanted Martin Luther put to death and the gospel prescribed in Germany. Though the German princes did not dare to repeal the emperor's edict, they finally hit upon a clever device for appeasing the pope without arousing the wrath of the people. They passed a decree saying that the Edict of Worms should be rigorously enforced as far as possible. For all practical purposes, this decree was a repeal of the Edict of Worms. For the majority of the German states had already declared that it was not possible to enforce the Edict of Worms. The Pope and the Emperor thought that they had gained a victory, but in reality they had suffered defeat. The Diet also decreed, without sanction from either the Pope or the Emperor, that a Diet should be assembled at the city of Spires in November to deal with the religious controversy between Luther and Rome. Now the Pope realized that if this Diet at Spires was held, that it would totally dethrone him. So he determined to do whatever possible to prevent this diet at Spires from happening. He sent his representative, Campeggio, and Campeggio went to Ratisbon, where he set to work to form a party among the princes of Germany. Drawing around him those sympathetic to the papal cause, such as Ferdinand, Archduke of Austria, the Dukes of Bavaria, the Archbishop of Salzburg, the Bishops of Trent and Ratisbon, and later the princes of southern Germany, he told them that should Luther's teachings triumph, it would spell the end of their power as well as the dissolution of the existing order of things. He assured them that the prosperity of the papacy was closely linked to their own welfare. When they heard this, they fell for it, and they determined to wage a war of extermination against the new faith. They began going through the countryside, burning books and killing anyone who was suspected of sympathizing with Luther's teachings. This fanatical rage continued for some time and extended even to some parts of northern Germany. From the humble peasant to the magistrate on his bench, there was no safety to be found anywhere. The country swarmed with papal spies. Now, as you can imagine, this spirit of rebellion and bloodshed migrated into some of the fanatical members of the common people, who, led by a fellow named Thomas Munzer, claimed to adhere to the teachings of Luther and were seeking to destroy Catholicism. But in reality, they were fighting against the real work of reform that Luther was promoting. Of course, this retaliation gave rein to anarchy and began what became known as the Peasants' War. The nobles formed armies to put down the insurgency, which resulted in over 300,000 people being slaughtered. All of this papal influence and this uprising succeeded in causing the princes to abandon the idea of their diet meeting at Spires much to the pleasure of the Pope. Though this war was carried out by rebellious fanatics, the Romanists placed the blame for all of this on Martin Luther, claiming that it was his reforms and teachings that were to blame for the fanatics' revolt. But the insurrection did not manifest itself in places such as Wittenberg, and those areas permeated by the influence of Luther's teachings. Or, when it did, it was only in the mildest of form, when it entered upon the ground where the Reformation had occupied, it lost its power, revealing that the gospel was the effective remedy for the problems that wrecked society. So now notice that history likes to repeat itself. What is at the beginning shows what is at the end. When the Protestant church began, it was at the same time that the world's focus was on the invading power of Islam and Rome was struggling to secretly unite all under her power. And at this same time, God has a reform movement that is taking place that has nothing to do with Islam, but is rather over the authority of the scriptures versus the authority of Rome. 
But in this reform movement, there are some fanatics. And the fanatics almost succeeded in derailing that reform movement. They were opposed to order and organization. They tended to reject the Bible and instead go with impressions that they received from the Spirit. And they also had a desire to fight everyone they deemed as enemies. Any of this sound familiar? In 1525, Luther's protector, Duke Frederick, died of old age, and in his place stood up three other princes, the elector John, his brother, Philip, Landgrave of Hesse, and Albert of Prussia. In June of this year, Luther married Katharina von Bora, one of the nuns who had escaped from the convents a couple years earlier. His marriage was an open rebuke to Rome. It was his way of saying to Rome, this is the obedience I give to your ordinances, and this is the awe in which I stand of your threatenings. Luther also received in this year a visit from William Tyndale, who was also influenced by Luther's translation of the Bible. In 1526, the emperor had defeated the French and had also gained control of both the northern and southern parts of Italy, as the most powerful force in the world, in spite of the fact that the Turks had now gained control of all of Hungary, Charles felt confident that with the help of the Pope, he could now go to Germany and succeed in having Luther executed and the reform abolished forever. So he called for a diet at Augsburg in order to deal with the problems of Luther. This diet was then moved to the city of Spires. But unknown to Emperor Charles, the Pope's ambition was to rule Italy himself, and at that moment, he was not focusing on supporting Charles in his fight against Luther, but was rather focusing on his personal agenda of breaking Charles's supreme power. The Pope sent his representatives to France to seek an alliance with them against Charles. Once the Pope had gotten France to join with him against Emperor Charles, then he got England to join the alliance and also the cities of northern Italy. So while this is taking place, they're having a diet at Spires. And the Diet at Spires began its proceedings with Ferdinand of Austria, the emperor's brother, presiding. And when the princes revealed that they were inclined to support Luther's teachings, Ferdinand pulled out a letter that had been written by Charles, commanding that all should act in full accord with the Edict of Worms, which meted out to the disciples of Luther's reforms, chains and prison and the stake. So when all this took place, the princes saw that they were surrounded. They sort of felt like they were surrounded kind of like the Israelites were at the Red Sea. But just as they were feeling totally helpless, just like the Israelites did, the rumor reached the Diet that the Pope had formed an alliance with France and England and had sent armies into Charles' territory to conquer him. This broke the power of Charles that he thought he had over the Diet of Spires. The Catholic members of the Diet dared not come to an open rupture with the Reformers. A decree was finally drawn up that, among other things, petitioned the emperor to return as speedily as possible to Germany, but until a future council could be held, it left the various German states free to act upon their own judgment with regard to religion. In other words, the 1526 Edict of Spires guaranteed religious freedom in the German states, as far as the states were concerned. In 1527, Charles sent his troops into Rome to conquer the Pope's forces. Charles' soldiers arrived at Rome, and in the initial assault, the commander was killed. This left the army without a leader to control the passion of the soldiers. And as the soldiers, angry with how Rome had treated them in the past, caught sight of all the wealth and the riches that the Pope had hoarded for centuries by the injustices inflicted upon the citizens of Europe, a storm of greed, rage, and bloodthirsty vengeance broke out. Soldiers totally sacked Rome confiscated the wealth and riches and killed many of the leaders of the Catholic Church and took pleasure in ridiculing and making mockery of Rome's traditions. The pillage lasted for 10 days. This effectively broke the papal control over the German states, allowing the Reformation to gain even more control. Rome had taken the position that wherever there is a line of ordained men, there and there only is the church. But the Reformation, on the other hand, said that wherever the word of God is faithfully preached, there is the church. In 1529, Emperor Charles called a second diet at Spires. 
for the purpose of repealing the 1526 Edict of Spires and reestablishing the Edict of Worms. In other words, the emperor and the Catholic leaders wanted to remove the edict that established religious freedom and reestablish the edict that condemned the Protestant reformers and get them executed. The princes, however, pointed out that the Edict of Spires was the constitution of the empire and that a movement to repeal it now would be a public breach of national faith and that the Lutheran princes would retain the right of resisting, if necessary, by force of arms. Until this time, each principality of Germany had possessed the right of regulating its own internal affairs, including the faith and worship of its subjects. But the issue at hand involved a constitutional one. If a majority of the Diet were now to claim the right of deciding the question for each individual state, it would surrender their individual rights to one central authority, and the individual states would no longer retain their self-government. Such a course would most certainly result in civil war. In an attempt to find a compromise, the Diet determined that they would neither abolish nor enforce the 1526 Edict of Spires. The Popish party placed on the table a carefully crafted proposition that would allow for each state to maintain whatever was the law at that time until such a time as a general council should meet. In some of the Catholic states, the Edict of Worms was already the law of the land the preaching of the gospel being forbidden and its confessors were burned. In other states, sympathetic to the Reformation, the Edict of Spires was the law and practice and the gospel was freely preached. This carefully crafted proposition essentially meant to each state that they would continue things as they had been. But it had some very significant modifications. Those free states that had enjoyed religious liberty were given the order that the mass should be celebrated, that it should be permitted, and that no one be allowed to renounce popery and embrace Lutheranism. In other words, while the proposal did not require that a single Protestant renounce his faith, it drew a line around the Reformation declaring that it had reached its furthest limits. This proposal was pushed rapidly by Ferdinand and the Popish faction and was quickly passed by the majority. Ferdinand pointed out to the princes that because the Diet had decided and voted on the matter, it remained only for them to submit to the decision of the majority. The Elector, the Landgrave, the Margrave of Brandenburg, the Prince of Anhalt, and the Chancellor of Lundberg, along with the deputies of all the free cities, consulted together. Never perhaps in the annals of history have men faced a more critical question. Should they submit to the rule of the majority? Having entered into the kingdom of heaven themselves, should they shut the door behind them? They decided no, they would not. They would rather endure everything, sacrifice everything, even their states, their crowns, and their lives. They said, let us reject this decree. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. Ferdinand and his priests decided to conquer this little rebellious uprising here. So they began to frighten and divide the free cities, which had always before pursued a common course. In the end, 21 of the free cities compromised and went ahead and adopted the proposal of the Diet, and only 14 firmly rejected it. This left the reformed princes with very little support, sort of the minority of the minority. Ferdinand refused to wait for the prince's response, and he left the Diet early. In his mind, the majority had already passed the proposal, and the princes had no response but to submit to it. But he underestimated the resolve of that small minority of reformers. The princes returned what they had written down. It was the 19th of April, 1529. Their declaration was called Protestio. It was their official protest against the past proposal of the Diet. We cannot consent to it, talking about the 1526 Edict of Spires, we cannot consent to its repeal, because this would be to deny our Lord Jesus Christ, to reject his holy word, and thus give him just reason to deny us before his father as he is threatened. Moreover, the new edict declaring the ministers shall preach the gospel, explaining it according to the writings accepted by the Holy Christian Church, we think that for this regulation to have any value, we should first agree 
on what is meant by the true and holy church. Now, seeing that there is a great diversity of opinion in this respect, that there is no sure doctrine but such as is conformable to the word of God, that the Lord forbids the teaching of any other doctrine, that each text of the Holy Scriptures ought to be explained by other and clearer texts, that this holy book is in all things necessary for the Christian, easy of understanding, and calculated to scatter the darkness, we are resolved with the grace of God to maintain the pure and exclusive preaching of his holy word, such as contained in the biblical books of the Old and the New Testament, without adding anything hereto that may be contrary to it. This word is the only truth. It is the sure rule of all doctrine and of all life, and can never fail or deceive us. He who builds on this foundation shall stand against all the powers of hell, whilst all the human vanities that are set up against it shall fall before the face of God. For these reasons, most dear lords, uncles, cousins, and friends, we earnestly entreat you to weigh carefully our grievances and our motives. If you do not yield to our request, we protest by these presents before God, our only creator, preserver, redeemer, and savior, and who will one day be our judge, as well as before all men and all creatures, that we, for us and for our people, neither consent nor adhere to any manner whatsoever to the proposed decree in anything that is contrary to God, to his holy word, to our right conscience, to the salvation of our souls, and to the last decree aspires. They made it clear that it did not matter how much the majority voted against God, they refused to abide by the majority's demands and that they would submit only to God and to the authority of the Bible. It is from this bold stand of the Reformed minority of German princes and their declaration, protestio, that the word Protestant gained its name. Here there is formed a division, the House of Austria and all its cities with the Emperor and the Dukes of Bavaria and their cities adhered to the Catholic faith, while Saxony, Hesse, Prussia, Anhalt, Lundberg, East Friesland, Schleswig Holstein, Sicily, and the cities of Nuremberg, Augsburg, Frankfurt, Ulm, Strasbourg, Bremen, Hamburg, and Ludbeck adopted what then became known as Protestantism. This Protestant movement has continued to grow and prosper ever since. It has shaped world events and founded nations. And in the very near future, this will again take center stage because prophecy declares that it's this issue will decide the destiny of every human on planet Earth. It is the authority of the word of God versus the authority of man's word. Contrary to what the world is saying today, the protest is not over. Nor will that protest ever be over until we see the Son of Man descending in the clouds of heaven. Sister White says, One of the noblest testimonies ever uttered for the Reformation was the protest offered by the Christian princes of Germany at the Diet of Spires in 1529. The courage, faith, and firmness of those men of God gained for succeeding ages liberty of thought and of conscience. Their protest gave to the Reformed Church the name Protestant. Its principles are the very essence of Protestantism. So did you notice something? Did you notice where this word protest came from? The Diet's proposal specifically gave those who were already Protestants the right to stay Protestants. They had the right to keep the beliefs that they had. But the problem was is that it forbade them to share their beliefs with others. They could not wit witness to Catholics and it forbade that anyone was to leave the Catholic faith and join the Lutheran faith. In other words, the spirit that drove the princes to file their protest against that proposal was the missionary spirit. That's that spirit that drives us to want to share the gospel truth with others instead of just keeping it for ourselves. The missionary spirit is the heart of Protestantism. And as such, those who lack the missionary spirit are not real Protestants. It is true, no doubt, that Protestantism, strictly viewed, is simply a principle. It is not a policy. It is not an empire having its fleets and armies, its officers and tribunals, 
herewith to extend its dominion and make its authority to be obeyed. It is not even a church with its hierarchies and synods and edicts. It is simply a principle, but it is the greatest of all principles. It is a creative power. Its plastic influence is all-embracing. It penetrates into the heart and renews the individual. It goes down to the depths and, by its omnipotent but noiseless energy, vivifies and regenerates society. It thus becomes the creator of all that is true and lovely and great, the founder of free kingdoms and the mother of pure churches. The globe itself it claims as a stage not too wide for the manifestation of its beneficent action, and the whole domain of terrestrial affairs it deems a sphere not too vast to fill with its spirit and rule by its law. Whence came this principle? The name Protestantism is very recent. The thing itself is very ancient. The term Protestantism is scarcely older than 350 years. That was back when this was written. It dates from the protest which the Lutheran princes gave in to the Diet of Spires in 1529. Restricted to its historical significance, Protestantism is purely negative. It only defines the attitude taken up at a great historical era by one party in Christendom with reference to another party. But had this been all, Protestantism would have had no history. Had it been purely negative, it would have begun and ended with the men who assembled at the German town in the year already specified. The new world that has come out of it is proof that at the bottom of this protest is a great principle which it has pleased Providence to fertilize, to make the seed of those grand, beneficent, and enduring achievements that have made the past three centuries, in many respects, the most eventful and wonderful in history. The men who handed in this protest did not wish to create a mere void. If they disowned the creed and threw off the yoke of Rome, it was that they might plant a purer faith and restore the government of a higher law. They replaced the authority of the infallibility with the authority of the word of God. The long and dismal obscuration of centuries they dispelled that the twin stars of liberty and knowledge might shine forth and that conscience being unbounded, the intellectual might awake from its deep solemnancy. And human society, renewing its youth, might, after its halt of a thousand years, resume its march toward its high goal. We repeat the question, whence came this principle? We ask our readers to mark well the answer, for it is the keynote to the whole of our vast subject and places us at the very outset at the springs of that long narration on which we are now entering. Protestantism is not solely the outcome of human progress. It is no mere principle of perfectibility inherent in humanity and ranking as one of its native powers in virtue of which when society becomes corrupt, it can purify itself and when it is arrested in its course by some external force or stops from exhaustion, it can recruit its energies and set forward anew on its path. It is neither the product of the individual reason nor the result of the joint thought and energies of the species. Protestantism is a principle which has its origin outside of human society. It is a divine graft on the intellectual and moral nature of man, whereby new vitalities and forces are introduced into it, and the human stem yields henceforth a nobler fruit. It is the descent of a heaven-born influence which allies itself with all the instincts and powers of the individual, with all the laws and cravings of society, and which quickening both the individual and the social being into a new life and directing their efforts to nobler objects permits the highest development of which humanity is capable and the fullest possible accomplishment of all its grand ends. In a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity. Now, there were many things that Protestantism differed with Rome on, which led to the five pillars of the Reformation. Only the Bible... Only grace, only Christ, only faith, and only for the glory of God. But they can all be summed up with the phrase sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only. The biggest difference between the Protestant reformers and the Catholics is that the Protestants wanted their beliefs founded on the word of God alone. While the Romanists incorporated the traditions of men and the authority of the popes, the priests, and the preachers as a basis for parts of their faith. With the Protestants, it was, what does the word of God say? 
But with the papists, it was, what does the church say? So how many of us are really Protestants today? How many of the modern so-called Protestant churches are in reality just modeled after the Roman Catholic church's mentality? Do we demand a thus saith the Lord from the word of God for the basis of our beliefs, or do we, in reality, when we come right down to it, base some of our beliefs on some man's teaching, what this pastor or that pastor or this leader or that theologian or this scholar or whatever has to say in the issue? Think about it. Can you honestly say that every one of your beliefs in religion or doctrine is well-founded on Scripture? Or is some of your beliefs just because some leading person that you might have respect for told you to believe that? If someone handed you a Bible and said, prove it, could you do it? How many of us would be willing to stand up in a courtroom even if we had to go against the majority and be able to answer for our faith? I challenge everyone to seriously think about every single religious belief you hold and answer the question, are you really still a Protestant? Protestant.